Good morning and welcome to our Pacific Morning Show. We hope you are having a great <coughs> Monday. We hope you are well. If you're driving the kids to school, please be safe on the road. If you're going to work, also be safe on the road. Or if you're not going to work. If you're not going to work, be safe. You're not at work. <laughs> <laughs> what a life. <laughs> what a life. Today, on today's show, we have a very, very special guest that we are honored to host. We have the amazing... Oh, I'll do my own drums this time. Oh, really? <laughs> we have the amazing, honorable Albito William Seal, who was the previous Minister for Pacific Peoples um, for the Labour Party. And he is here to join us on the show. So he has been a Ooh. member. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Alpito William Seal has been a member of the Labour Party since 1986. Uh, he has been the elected member of parliament for the Mangere electorate since 2008. That's a long time. So prior to entering the New Zealand parliament in 2008. No, it wasn't my reaction. Was yeah. <laughs> it's just making me feel so old yeah. when, when you say long time. Uh, for, you know, I was actually expressing that as experienced. Yeah. <laughs> experienced minister. He's also the first Pacifica deputy mayor of Manukau which is a huge accomplishment. And he was previously the Minister for Pacific Peoples and Minister for Courts, as well as the Associate Minister of Foreign Affairs, Associate Minister of Education, Associate Minister of Justice, and Associate Minister of Health. Mm. That's a lot of profiles. I had the largest portfolio right. of any ministers. In the How do you handle that? I can imagine your CV is like... I know, well, right? The good thing is the Prime Minister just sent out doing only gave me those portfolios because I actually thought I could do a lot more. And wow. then I realized after, <laughs> oh gosh, it would have killed me if I had more portfolios. Yeah. So lovely to have you on our show. Thank you so much for coming on and spending time. How are you today? How's your day been? Feeling good. Um, mm. You know, the Mangere sun is shining out there brightly on everyone here in <laughs> I love how we're in Papatoy and he's calling it the Mangere Sun. <laughs> 275, born and raised in Mangri. Team Mangere. Now, that, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a really good day. How are you today, Saw? Alive. <laughs> Papatoy. Thank you, Jesus, for guiding me here today. <laughs> nah, happy to be here. Good mm. to see you and uh, good to see the former minister here, the, the honorable. So uh, I'll be so I'll William C. Oh, yeah, no, nah, happy to be here. And it feels weird being at a big boy table here. I know. I'm nervous. Yeah, I wore my cardigan. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's the air condition. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but thank you so much. Let's get straight into it. Yeah. Let's start our show. Mm. I'm going to be a bit cheeky and I'm going to ask you um, something I wanted to talk to you about, you know, with politics being heated up left, right and center on social media. Watch Gilisi. Do you think is the best Kirisi? Kirisi one, Kirisi two, <laughs> Kirisi young, Kirisi old, Kirisi with a bit of hair and the Kirisi <laughs> without the hair. And you take your pick, but my Kirisi is Chris Kirisi Hipkins. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going for Kirisi Hipkins. Nice oh, one. Look, uh, mm. yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I know both of them, um, but I've worked with Chris Hipkins, um, whereas with Chris uh, Luxon, Oh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> um, with Chris Hipkins, um, I worked with him in the education portfolio as Associate uh, Education Minister in the Pacific Space, and also worked with him in the health portfolio when he was leading the COVID mm. uh, response as I was Associate Health for Pacifica. And I have to say, I, I gained huge respect in that period. He actually was listening, he supported the vision and the work that I was projecting to him. And so, you know, I think I supported him becoming a uh, leader and prime minister for the for the government. And I really do have confidence that he can take this new team across the line come October. Mm. And, and I think once he does that, I think he'll have the chance to prove to the rest of New Zealand, those who aren't backing us at, at the moment, that he would be a good prime minister in this particular time. Mm. But so far, 
I think, you know, he's standing up, mm. giving people confidence and certainly giving the elders and many that I've come across uh, a certain confidence about a leader that is trying to do the right thing. He's not in panic mode, mm. not trying to be critical of left, right and centre like right. the other Kelly see. He's just focused. <laughs> he's focused on doing what needs to be done for the nation, particularly in the response to the issues that are important to us, <clears throat> the response to Gabriel and mm. the families, because we haven't necessarily all fully recovered. Yeah, The response to the cost of living, uh, wages, and, and those things are really, really important to our community. Mm. So, Kelisi Hipkins for me. Kelisi Hipkins, and any thoughts on Kelisi Luxon? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I've been around politics for a long time. And and yes, parties push people up. But you have to have a bit of time under your belt. Mm. I'm also, you know, I have good relationships across the house. Mm. And so I know that he's got his supporters within his team. But I also know he has people in his team that still have to be persuaded that he's the right leader for the National mm. Party. Um, but we're a long ways away. Um, it, they say that um, uh, opposition governments don't win elections. Mm. Mm. So I'm not expecting them to win. Mm. <laughs> mm. I'm expecting the government to do what a government does to respond to the needs of the community, particularly in, in these challenging times. Mm. Yeah, that's great. But we all know we're under the one Yesu Gerisiano. <laughs> <laughs> the real Gilles. Oh. So shout out to Jesus. We follow you, but thank you so much for those comments. Oh, but, <laughs> hey, but our people always will say that. Um, uh, absolutely. Let us pray for the government. Let us pray for good people to to be elected in government. Mm. Um, and you have to remember also that we live in a in a um, in a in a different kind of a political system, mm. MNP. Mm. And so it's not just the two Kilises. Mm. It's also the Green Party. What's his name? James Shaw. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> What's the laugh and, about? <laughs> and, and the Māori Party, um, yeah. particularly Ngāwiri and Pekka, who are doing a fantastic job. Mm. And then you've got these other small parties. Yeah. Out there, you know? And so, you know, I think you expect to see a tight uh, election, but also expect to see a coalition government. And I'm putting my hands up, you know, for... Uh, uh, a Labour, Green, Māori Party coalition, but that all depends on people's choices. So you're absolutely right. Let us pray and then go out and vote Labour. Yeah. What if, <laughs> what if, what what if, said. What if we? What if Winston Peters makes a comeback? How is your uh, friend Winston? I saw him at the uh, ASB Party Feast. <laughs> yeah. And he was smiling away. He says uh, lots of opportunities here. He had Derek, his young offsider there, and I says, problem is you're losing a lot of your supporters, the elderly generation. Yeah. So he was out and about here at the Polyfest. So mm. good on him for being out there. Um, you can never write Winston off, though. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, he looked fit and young. Yeah. You know, a lot fitter than Willie Jackson on the day, you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you can never write that off. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it is the people that make the choice. Yeah. I am hopeful that your generation, all the Māori and Pacific, that generation, young, beautiful, brown, beautiful, brainy, bilingual, by culture and bold, eight Bs and Māngere, because they're brilliantly blessed, mm -hmm. they get out and boat. I think if they get out and boat in full force, they will determine who the government will be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm. And that's something we've been encouraging as well, as trying to get the Tupulanga out to vote. Mm. It's very difficult job, eh? How have you found in your experience trying to get to rally the youth? I think um, with young people in my campaigns in Māngere, I've always given them the opportunity to run my campaign in a way that they feel appropriate. Mm -hmm. So when you see groups dancing out in the streets with, that's that's them. Mm -hmm. They created songs, you know, follow the leader, follow the leader. <laughs> <laughs> um, they run it. I think um, young people m probably need an emotional connection, mm. not only to the people who are the political uh, voices, but they need to have an emotional connection to the issues that are being debated. I hope 
that when any politician starts using racism and discrimination as a political weapon, that our young people knock them on the head, <laughs> you know, by protesting, by voicing their view, views against Yeah, them. not literally, right? No, no. no. <laughs> uh, theoretically. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows, someone can cut that clip and be like, look, he's endorsing well, he's people endorsed, to knock oh others. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, no, I think... You know, what I mean is they're going to find their voice. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. articulate that voice, articulate strongly, use all the platforms, beginning from the garage in South Auckland. You know? mm. <laughs> use yes. all of those platforms and get that voice out. Mm. But I think that's an issue because too often I hear politicians on the other side, when they're not getting cut through, they start using uh, the tactics of divide and rule. Yep. Yep. And racism comes up almost every election year mm. when certain parties aren't getting cut, cut through. Mm. And I would say uh, to our young people, pay attention to that and, and make sure they have a view and oppose it and make sure they act on it. Mm. I remember back in 2005, I think it was Don Brash, you know, he started articulating a view against Māori. Mm. Um, and I said to our communities, hey, when that Palangi man starts attacking Māori, we've got to stand up for Māori. Because mm. after they attack them, they'll be attacking us. Exactly. But when they're attacking them, they're also attacking our whanaunga. Mm. And similarly for the Asian communities. So, you know, I've always believed that we've got to support Māori, but be prepared to stand up for them also. But in Auckland, we have the biggest diverse population than any other city. There's more brownies than Balangis in Auckland. Mm. And so we can literally determine the outcome of this coming election by getting out and voting. Yep. But mm. we've got to pay attention to it. So this program, fantastic that you guys are doing it. Thank you so much. Yeah. I've, um, I've got to ask, when, uh, in 2005, when Don Brash was saying that, was that the year you got mud thrown on him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. You got what thrown on him? You got mud thrown on him. Like, oh, I gosh. think he was at a, was it White Tongue? Yes. I think, and he was like in the middle of like this interview and then all of a sudden you just see like. Yeah. Oh uh, my goodness. But it's also the year that even though the polling booths closed at seven o'clock, we had long lines of people still in line to get voted, mm. to go in and vote in mm. South Auckland. Mm. And it was the year where we were able to show the power of the Pacific vote in South Auckland, Pacific and Māori vote, because we are the ones that turn that flow from Don Brash and mm. made sure that the Helen Clark came in, mm. government came in. Mm. 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 Powerful. So, power to the brown vote. What we like to do on this morning show is we like to share positive quotes from all our guests that have helped them get through life. It doesn't have to be one. You can choose many. Um, but we want to ask you, what is one quote or quotes mm. that has gotten you through life? I think the, the – I mean, it's not just one quote, but the quote that has gotten me through life is, um, is a number of quotes that my mother gave me. I remember get, she gave it to me when we were living in Odahu. Um, Whatever thou art, act well thy part. And I was around eight or nine years old. And for some reason, rather, I believed it was a Samoan quote. Mm. <laughs> Until I got older, then it, uh, it was something that a church leader right. gave. And it was something that came from Scotland. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what if I thought well, like, well, that part? But it was about, um, you know, it doesn't matter what role you have. And we used to do cleaning. So it doesn't matter whether you're a cleaner in the pub or the hospital. It doesn't matter whether you're a church leader or a bus driver. It doesn't matter whether you're a matai or a young person, elderly, or a minister. Do it well. Mm. And and do it well from a Samoan perspective is do it for the family. Do it for the people. Do it for the ainga or the nu'u malikarisia. Mm. Those are the three pillars of grouping that we were always told to totua, to serve. And so all of my life, those are the sayings. You know, I remember sitting down on the floor. I sometimes felt, are we going to get it telling, telling off? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But we'd sit on the floor and our mum and dad would give us these talks. And there are certain sayings that were repeated. You know, you know, you serve. And of course, we'd get up and say, all right, you go do the dishes, wash the car, mow the lawn. 
And um, as the elders, I would give the instructions. <laughs> mm. The privileges um, of being the eldest, eh? I know, but here's the thing. <laughs> the tau tour never ends. And it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're a minister, you still tau tour. I still do that with the leaders of the, across the Pacific region, mm. whether it be in Tuvalu or whether it be in New York. Um, here also, I don't, you know, as a minister, you, your role is to talk to our, our people. And I'm always gravitating to make sure that the elderly and most vulnerable are looked after. You lot are the young ones, so you're stronger and you should be tattooing me. Mm. Say that you <laughs> I, Well, I think I am pretty good at making a cup of tea. Um, my auntie's can attest to that. Uh, mm. Bit rusty. <laughs> Been having a bit too many uh, coffees over at uh, at the cafes. Yeah. <laughs> no, that that's awesome. And I think that's such a powerful powerful thing to live by if you're going to do something do it well yeah 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 we mm. yeah it's it's one of the core principles that were established yeah. as part of the tongan whaikawe kola mm. the four golden values mamahi mea do things to the best yeah. of your ability Absolutely. and yeah and i see that heaps of times in my own community and especially the oldies like my parents mm. and um aunties and uncles they're like yeah they'll they'll they, they they give their all and not expect anything back. Mm. And I'm just like, that's a, that's a crazy act of selflessness. Eh? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. But you asked the question about a saying, but mm. the impression I got in my head was my mother. Mm. Now, you know, who was the most influential person in my life? It's my mother. Yeah. And I, it, it, you know, that came to mind because I saw the movie um, Red, White and Brass. Yeah. Mm. And the mother, Violetti Fimau, mm. you know, she was the one that counseled the uh, Reverend Tevita, mm. <laughs> you know, to, I think the quote was something, sometimes we listen to the people, sometimes we've got to listen to our children. Yes. Yeah. My mother behaved in the same way with my dad because she was a staunch supporter of me being involved in politics from, mm. from a very young age. And, and, and she had the most influence on me. I mean, I remember another quote, I think we were just having some challenging time in my personal life. And I can't remember exactly how it came about, but this will pass, you know. Ooh. And I think, you know, whatever challenges that you go through life, no matter whether you've lost money <laughs> and you don't know how to pay the bill, mm. uh, you have no petrol in your car and you don't know how to get from A to B, mm. um, or you don't know whether your girlfriend or your wife is happy or angry with you, etc. cetera. Um, I think this will pass always meant that you can, at some stage, you'll look back on the worry and you think, oh, why was I so worried? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So everything, this will pass. <clears throat> everything, give it time. Time is your friend. Do you know what I like about that quote? It literally helps when you're in the situation. And you have to keep your mind resilient. Yeah. You know, it's like, this will pass. You're in it. Think that. Move forward. But also <coughs> as a minister, mm. um, you know, there are some things you have no control over. Mm. And you don't worry about it. Mm. <laughs> you know, and so, and I suppose in life, there are some things you have no control over. Exactly. And so you can't worry about it. Mm. And you just allow yourself see what happens yeah do the best you can mm. see what happens yeah you can't yeah you can't control the world mm. but you can control how you react yeah. mm. to the chaos around yeah. you yeah yeah absolutely that, but, that's beautiful but you're right it, mm. it helps with mental resilience yeah mm. that's it so if you're driving powerful powerful I, I really like that if you're driving to work and your tire pops this will pass, guys. <laughs> if you're driving to work and you don't have lunch money and you, you're really hungry and your stomach is grumbling, this will pass. You know, we all go through different challenges, but we hope that these quotes, the wealth of knowledge coming from Alpizzo himself helps you get through today. And uh, we'll be right back. Good morning.
So, on a ball. When did you move to New Zealand and what was it like in your experience moving here as a Samoan? Mm. 1969. The airport wasn't here in Auckland. <laughs> it was um, Helensville. Well, that side of Auckland. Mm. And um, we travelled by a boat out of Samoa, wow. um, the Tofua, and that went from island to island, then to Tonga. Our mother told us off because we lost some mats. We had put it out to dry in the sun and we were supposed to sit on it, but mm. me and my sister started playing and the wind blew it. And <laughs> oh, man. I know. Yeah. Mm. Those memories are seared in my brain. I can't forget it. Yeah. Um, landed in Suva, travelled by bus, uh, saw so many frogs, and then caught the plane here. In those days... Um, it's kind of funny because nobody's waiting for us at the, uh, the airport. And and they thought we were coming a week later. Yeah. Because in those days, it took a month for a letter to right. leave the islands to get here. Yeah. And so luckily, my father, who had been here previously, uh, working in Kingleaf Forestry and Meatworks and all of that, he knew where to go, so we took a cab. But when we got there, the door was locked. <laughs> <laughs> And um, but there was an open window, so yeah. I climbed through the window, opened the door, mm. and we just fell asleep. Yeah. And then in the evening, when we woke up, we could hear everybody talking in the kitchen. And that's when we went out. But what was it like? Pretty scary, you know, leaving friends and the village and family, coming into a new world where it was cold. That evening, I ate potatoes for the first time. It was watery, stuff, yeah. not like taro. Yeah. No, no. no. <laughs> mm. And it was funny. Uh, going to school, I remember the kids teased us. Coconut, mm. coconut, coconut. And because I had sisters, I was had fist fights. Well, I was a good boxer, so I didn't have a lot of fist fights. Punch and that was it. <laughs> but, but so you've had a lot of KOs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh no, because I think um, we were sort of an oddity, new, yeah. primarily a lot of Balangi kids. Um, the new way Cook Islanders, they were more akin to Māori. They were New Zealand citizens, so they didn't necessarily see themselves as island kids, you know. Mm. We were the island kids. <laughs> mm. um, so it was very different. I think racism, um, you sort of started to see it, but you didn't understand what it was. Yeah. Um, but in saying that, I have good memories of our Balangi neighbours um, showing us, sharing with me their TV. Oh. And, you know, I think Space Ghost was the cartoons on Saturday. Right. You know, um, I made friends with a... A Chinese boy and an Indian boy. Narish was his friend, his name. Chinese boy was Donald. Here, this was Odahu Primary School. Yeah. And then we went to, um, when my parents bought a house in Otara, we moved there and I went to Mayfield Primary School, then Beds Intermediate, then Hillary College. Right. Otara. Shout out to Bim Sir Edmund Bim Hillary. Yeah. Mm. Otara, capital of Manukau City. Straight into your lane, into your hood. But it was mm. strange because I left the island where lots of elders and we we knew our roles, we knew our place. Then coming here, we're a small family group, mm. even though I had five you know, sisters. Mm. Um, and, and suddenly we were in that small grouping. But then over time, we expanded again with cousins, uncles and aunts coming and living with us. Mm. Well, um, well, what is it? We, because what year? Sorry, what year again was it that you had arrived in New Zealand? Nineteen sixty nine. Nineteen sixty nine. Seems like it was only yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, that's the that's the crazy thing about time. You wake up, oh man, this this is not meant to be here. <laughs> um, I know. Yeah, well, because that's around about dawn raid period, wasn't mm. it? So you absolutely would have lived through um, it. And Otara, I mean, we settled in Otara when our parents bought their first house. And we were part of the Samoan Catholic Society. My dad was one of the leaders there. And, of course, 
lots of Māori, lots of Pacific new migrants from Samoa, Tonga, uh, predominantly, and it it was also the time around the early 1970s that suddenly you'd hear the protests, you'd hear what was happening elsewhere, mm. and then it happened to us. Wow. And then can it happened I, sorry, in can I time. track you right there? <laughs> when you were hearing that it was happening to other people, what were your thoughts at the time? Oh, we would hear stories of these big uh, kids, the Polynesian Panthers, mm. University out in Auckland, and, you know, we were 12, 13, thinking, ah, oh, you know, those kids are those posh Pacific kids <laughs> <laughs> can afford university yeah. and all of that, living in that posh place down there in Park yeah. Nihau. Mm. Yeah. Um, but but it kept, we were interested in it. Uh, we were interested because we would see things on the news. Um, my dad was an avid reader, so, you know, the newspaper was always available at 8 o'clock on Sundays. Mm. You see pictures of protests or stories about uh, brown people being picked up by the police. Mm. And and there was certain nervousness. We all talked about it at school. Um, and then when it happened to my family, mm. it, it was traumatizing. I, I don't know, as young people, you're a bit nervous, scared, but you're also angry about it. But we talked about it, all of us, and it wasn't just our family. There were other families in Otara, in Odahu, and and when the priests got all of our parents together to talk about how do we get those people who are locked up in Odahu prison out, yeah, you know, and then the court cases. Um, we weren't involved in those, but we were involved in preparing the cups of teas, mm. sitting on the floor waiting at Bakula, the, you know, the... The, the bowl of water for washing hands, etc. Mm. So you're listening to all the conversation mm. and you're hearing the emotion, you're hearing people cry yeah. or hearing stories about pregnant women crying at the Oho prison, you know, mm. and, and then you start hearing stories of people being deported. Mm. I had a cousin who got deported mm. and, and I know his son will, will probably feel embarrassed about it, but <laughs> Jerome Kainal, Yep. Yes. All black? Yeah. His father was one of the, my, his father's my dad's uh, nephew. You know, he got picked up, got deported, went back. Hello, fine. But then they came back, you know. And he still picked to play for the All Blacks? Still play for the All Blacks. <laughs> and if I was him, that, I would have been like, so oh, I know. I mean, that's the story. Yeah. That's the, those are the one of many Dawn Raid stories. And so it was a very traumatizing experience for so many families and so many levels and I think that's why the apology that we gave uh, in in 2021 with Jacinda under the fine mat that's why that was so important mm. um, but those are stories that we've still yet to tell but I think that apology it helped us all I believe one um, begin a process of recognizing that it was harm that was wrongly done to us. Mm. To, to begin a process of recognizing that we are, have something to be proud of, our languages, our culture, and to be proud of our contribution to Aotearoa New Zealand. Mm. Loved how Princess Mele conveyed that heartfelt response on behalf of our community on the night. Mm. And so, you know, out of something bad, I think we have to recognize that Pacific people have, through sweat, blood, and tears, given so much to this nation. Mm, absolutely. And interesting, you know, we were there at the Dawn Raids. Blue was there at the Dawn Raids Apology, and I absolutely loved it. It was so emotional. Um, not loved it in a sense where it was exciting, but um, in a respectful sense. Mm. But we had, you know, a lot of backlash from our own people. What are your thoughts around that? I... I think there there would have been a lot of um, misunderstanding. Yes. There were people who didn't know what was happening. Mm. Um, I think I, I'm intending to tell the full story about why the location was chosen, mm. uh, the way that we used um, Ngati Fatua, that we involved Ngati Fatua, the symbolism of that, of Niwe, of Cook Islands, of Tonga, of Samoa, uh, there's a story behind 
what people saw. Mm. Not everybody would have understood that. There's a reason why certain individuals were chosen to lift the mat, yes. if they so desired. Mm. There's a certain reason why certain people spoke on that night. Um, I attempted, with the blessing of the Prime Minister, to use symbolism, to use our language and culture. Because when we apologise, it's not just to say sorry. And exactly. You I don't think there's a word in sorry in Psalm 1. That's right. <laughs> you know, in Psalm 1, the word mm. is, is, is about humbling yourself, to lower yourself. You know, isn't to say sorry, it's, it's actions to show that you really do mean Absolutely. how you feel. Mm. And that was the way the, the Fonga was conducted, or the apology was conducted to sort of display that it's not enough to say sorry. Mm. You have to mean it, you have to feel it, and what has been said has to be believable. Mm. Yeah. Normally an apology would be a couple of speeches and then some sandwiches. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. This, it, it was a way of there, our communities who were present could feel it and could respond. Mm. And they did respond in kind with songs of gratitude. The poetry. The poetry. Mm. All of that. That's the combination. The apology wasn't just one thing. It was a combination of things. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the gifting that normally happens, you know, in any gathering, in any form, yeah, the traditional gifting, but I, you know, I, I changed it because it was a more about symbolism. Mm. Yes, we got tangible gifts. The Tuli Takes Flight Scholarship. Yes. Mm. You know, the Leadership Scholarship that Nanaya Mahuta provided the money for. Um, those things were important, mm. but it was how it was presented. Yeah. Because that's how we do things in the Pacific, mm. being open, being transparent, and and then the, the calls from the young men and the young women to let the whole world know that this is what's happening. Mm. So, so this was going on in the town hall. Oh, yeah, I was outside. Mm. Um, <laughs> were, you, were you throwing stones from outside? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, I was I was outside with my dog, just like hugging my dog because I was like having quite a, like yeah, you know, I was having my own like yeah response to what was going on inside, and I was just like, oh man, mm. I'm so, I mean, so happy to see it happen. Yeah. The, yeah. the event had been cancelled a number of times yeah. because of COVID. Yeah. Um, the town hall was symbolic because it was the seat of authority yeah. in, back in the days yeah. of the council. And it was also a place where we weren't necessarily welcome. Mm -hmm. And you'll note that all that area, K Road, that was Pacific area yeah. mm. in the 1950s, 1960s, mm. up to the 1970s. You know, the St. Joseph Catholic Church on Great North yeah. Road, that was the first someone speaking parish there. Mm. You know, my dad lived down the road. And as Catholics, they attended that. Mm. Um, you know, that was our space in the early 60s. And, mm. and so that was why that was important. Uh, Ngāti Whātua, even though they were Māori, they were picked up. Mm. The spokesperson on that night, um, he was picked up mm. and wrongly imprisoned. <laughs> you know, so I will tell the full story at some stage. Yes, yeah. Behind the scenes and why that was important in the way it is. Mm. I think it was also important. I am probably the only one in government that have sat through a number of ifongas in my own family. And so I know I saw people saying, "Oh, that's not a real ifonga." Yeah. Absolutely, it was a real ifonga, you know, because the the people who were there were people who experienced it. And what the message they they send us of gratitude towards the cinder, being prepared to humble herself. I could not have her sit on the floor because she's the prime minister. Mm. You know? yeah. So I sat her on the chair. Um, but if you look to some more. They had the archbishop there do a ifonga about two months. And he was on the floor, yeah. Mm. You, you know, so, mm. you know, mm. as the matai of the ceremony, 
I have rights and privileges of how I would determine yep. how ceremonies ought to be done. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not fussed by any of the criticism. Yep. Um, that um, the way that we did it was a way to help heal our community, to help our communities feel empowered, mm. and to help the, the government, my government ministers understand the harm and the trauma and how this will take time to help our communities heal. But also to see, despite all of that, our sense of humour, yep. our gracefulness in singing our prayers and thanks to God yeah. above yep. and our dancing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, um, you've been through a lot of, you've seen and witnessed a lot of our history, Pacific history in New Zealand. What ticked you to enter politics? Who did someone influence you to go down yeah. that direction? What was the reason you decided to yeah. take a political career? Because first of all, I want to say it's not an easy career. Yeah. The first part of it is probably you're not getting any money. You're just putting yourself out there, trying to get onto the list. Even then, it's difficult. It's a difficult process. So, what? Yeah. Why did you want to do um, pursue politics? Um, I, I think a number of things. You have to understand the time and year I was born. I was born in 1960 mm. when Samoa and the elders, the Mo movement, were finally achieving what they had been seeking to be independent. Mm. And if you looked during that era, you'd see signs. Good governance is no substitute for self-governance. Mm. It was in the English. Um, and the people holding those signs had no shirt on and no shoes, <laughs> just mm. a lover lover. But they held up those signs when a delegation from the United Nations came to right. Samoa. Mm. Mm. And Samoa was the first country to be independent from the colonial rulers. Mm. My sister who was born a couple of years after me, her name is Tutotasi. That was the year Samoa became independent. Yeah. So I was born during a time when all of this was happening uh, the grand migration to New Zealand, huge hopes and expectation. So I was amongst uncles and aunts and a grandfather who'd say, I hope my son becomes a politician. Mm. I hope my grandson becomes a politician. And those things have rung in my ears. You know, even in the Catholic Church, you'd hear the elders, I wish one of our boys would be a politician. Mm. And then it so happened around about 1986, I'd returned from overseas and the Catholic elders who were members of the Labour Party mm. on council asked myself and some of the boys, go and register voters at the Otara Flea Market, mm. put up our signs, deliver these leaflets, all done for free. You know? yeah. <laughs> you know? mm. And we had fun. We'd pretend like we'd hide in the van and change our voices, speaking in Samoan, speaking in English. Because yeah. it was a bit embarrassing at first. You Probably know. cracking jokes on the way back oh, home. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. It, it, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it, but yeah, you, you feel a bit embarrassed to go out there and asking your friends, hey, can you vote? For me? Yeah. You know? yeah. So we had a bit of fun. It took us a bit of time. Yeah. But that's what. And then when you're formally involved, in those settings and meetings and you're listening and they're boring as meetings, but you begin to think, oh my goodness, um, I can do a better job then. <laughs> <laughs> and I began to take it quite seriously. The mm. elders would encourage me. And that's what mm. happened. Oh, see, they sparked that confidence in you, eh? Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, I gotta ask, as, as a Samoan man, I mean, I'm not Samoan, um, I just want that for the record to remind everyone. <laughs> yeah. um, what, are, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in your political career as a Samoan? Mm. I'm, I'm quite clear on my point of difference. Mm. I live two worlds. You know, we live in the Palangi world and then we live in the Samoan world. Yep. Likewise, I suspect with you. For those who do not live in that world, they have no idea. Mm. Mm. So it's quite challenging trying to help them understand the dreams and aspirations that you carry with you as a politician mm. are not simply mine alone. They belong to the community. Right. Yep. 
and that the aspirations of the community, you know, far outweigh the aspirations of the individual. Yeah. Mm. And that can be quite challenging because in politics, you're there to win. Yep. And whereas for us, you're wanting to look after uh, a community, mm. it, it's just a lifelong journey. Yeah. But politics is only for time only, yeah. a period, a short term period. Yeah. Mm. And so it, kind of, it, it does get quite challenging. And I think when you have a parliament that's dominated by people who speak only one language, yeah. who only see one worldview, mm. that's a challenge in itself. And now you can understand why it's taking so long for Māori. Yeah. Mm. You know, this is their land. Yeah. They have the TDT of Waitangi that was signed in 1840. Now you begin to understand why it's so important for us to be backing them and supporting them, mm. why it's taking them for so long. Mm. But at the same time, saying to Māori, it's not just about you. We're also part of your whanonga. Yeah. Um, we have a duty to support one another in this journey. Right. And those are those are challenges. They're not easy things. Hey, but we were also present for the strengthening of kinship at the marae in... Oh, I forgot what it was. The marae in... Orake. Orake, yeah. Oh, yeah. We were there. I was like... Ngati Fatu Orake. Ngati Fatu. It started at like 5 a.m. Mm. Fires, traditional Tongan singing on nose flutes. It was such a beautiful mm. thing to witness. You heard them whangos going. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but see, those are the challenges. Mm. I mean, in your generation, you're hearing more people speak our languages. Mm. You're hearing more, you're seeing more people wearing the lava lava around. Mm. There was a time where some of us were quite nervous. I remember walking down the street and a couple of Pakia kids came down and told us, you coconuts ought to go home. You know, oh. all of those things happened. So... You know, those are the challenges that we face. Yeah. Mm. Here's the other challenge. I mean, the Dawn Raids was deliberate, intentional policy backed by government, backed yep. by the Labour Party as well as the National Party. Mm. Yep. I mean, Labour Party might have started it, but yep. the National the Party, Party made it worse. Mm. <laughs> you know? They did. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's what we experience, you know, flat-out racism, being kicked out of your house. Mm. But our young people today, those who are born here, who travel on a, a New Zealand passport, they're still talking about it. They're telling me that that's what they're experiencing. So, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, we call it unconscious bias. But if you, here's an easy thing you look at all the government departments and you ask yourself how many Māori and Pacific chief executives. Mm -hmm. Well, it's only been recently that you have Marge at Health, mm. yeah. Laulu at MCH, mm. Geraldine at MPP. I can't remember the name of the CEO of TPK mm. and the Māori Language Commission. But not a lot. It's, it's you know, I remember having these challenges back in the 1980s as, well, as a public servant, asking certain individuals, we need more people at leadership levels. Mm. So so those are the challenges. The constant you challenges, know. yeah. Mm. Mm. And it's ongoing, never ends. Yeah. yeah, but we've seen improvements throughout the years. Absolutely. And I feel like a lot of our youth have to see those, um, the path that, that has been set before them and appreciate them more. Yeah. Because um, I've found a lot, um, the younger generation always think we're inventing the wheel, you know, but... There is always the people who came before us to make sure we are where we are now. I mean, mm. <coughs> I've often heard um, the younger people say, we need a seat at the table. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's fine. But in a Samoan context, fesili muri mai ya mo mai. Amen. <laughs> oh, my gosh, and, I wanted to say this so much, but I'm so glad uh, you're uh, saying it. <laughs> and, and you have to talk to her. What yeah. does that mean? Um, Sorry. Serve before you think mm. you can sit at the oh, table. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. You know, um, <coughs> there's a transition in all things. Mm -hmm. And it's, if I give you a spot at the table, what will you do at that yeah. table? Yeah. It's not just sitting at the table. Yeah, you got to earn it. you got to earn it. But you've also got to be, you have to have a vision for mm. what you want to change. Mm. I've seen, you know, we've given people opportunities. 
where they've taken that opportunity and they think the title itself means that they've achieved something. Exactly. But it's not. Yeah. The totua never ends. Yep. <laughs> you know, but what you've got to do is use the roles and the responsibilities to make some good. Mm. To make some good for whom? Mm. <laughs> you know, your family. Now, when I'm talking family, it's the extended family. Yeah. Mm. It's uh, when I'm talking the nu, it's the whole community. Yeah. And a karishia is everybody, yeah. you know. So those are the things that I sort of feel like I'm the bridge between the old ways and the new ways. Mm. And I'm asking our young people, absolutely, you've got a role and responsibility. Mm. But don't lose yourself in this. Mm. Um, there is something to be gotten from the thousands of years of experience of our people that are captured in those old sayings. Mm. And so, you know, don't uh, don't be in such a rush unless you've got a plan, be clear in the vision, and we all buy into it. Mm. Mm. That's a great way to put it. And I just wanted to ask you as well, because, you know, you've been in the space for a long time. You've got a lot of experience. I know. <laughs> I should stop saying long time. A lot of experience. But, you know, as Pacifica people, you, we've seen the speeches. We all like to say, we are one under the banner of Jesus or whatever. We <laughs> like to say, <laughs> Moana Nui Akiwa. Moana Nui Akiwa. Yeah. There we go. We've seen it Blue all. Pacific continent. <laughs> <laughs> so we like to, well, there's many occasions we like to say we're all under this one umbrella. But the truth is we're not one umbrella. We're a diverse amount of people with different values, yep. different needs, Um Different shades of brown. Different shades of brown. That's what that's what it is. And how have you, as a minister, been able to manage all of those different diverse needs um, across communities? Because you're one person yeah. trying to serve these so many different, um, you know, views. Yeah. How did you do it? Yeah, I don't think I really did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you're you, you're absolutely right. Mm. I think you both have identified a huge challenge in our community, but it's also quite an exciting thing to work in our community, because our communities, once you build trust, and you build those trusting relationships, then they'll listen. But if you turn up being a crook, mm. <laughs> if you turn up, you know, our people feel things. Yeah. So it's not just enough for fantastic speech. They have to feel they can trust you. Yeah. And I think I've served um, a long time before I got into politics that the things I advocated for, language, prosperity, health, the youth, are not new things. Mm -hmm. They're things that other elders have championed for. I've just picked up the baton and attempted to continue that. I, I disagree with you that we have different values. Mm. Um, I think there's a common set of values that uh, are still core of who we are. Mm. Um, but yes, we've picked up other values and they're not necessarily our values, mm. but we're using it because of the world that we live in. Mm. Um, but I never give up on that one of our strengths is working together. Yep. One mm. of our strengths is to focus on our aina, no. One of our strengths is having a vision for the next generation coming through. Mm. But it's not just in New Zealand, in the region too, that we all talk, you know. We are one. <laughs> <laughs> but oftentimes um, the leaders are influenced mm. by so many things. And one of the things I always try to do is, is keep talking about those values. You know, my elders would say, our foundational values must remain the same, mm. but the way that we apply that will be different, must be fit for purpose from time to time. Yep. And that means not just being nice, but being a little bit angry with people if they're not doing the right thing. Mm. Mm. Um, humility is a, is, a, is a principle that we live in, but that doesn't mean that you put up with what's wrong. Yeah, mm. but, you know, and somebody must always be prepared to point out the wrongs, yeah. you know, um, and then be prepared to pull them back in so that you don't create an enemy mm. <laughs> for life. 
Um, and that's been my style, I suppose, of trying to bring people together. Lots of criticism. Sometimes when I'm prioritizing Polynesia, mm. when the money is, is them, and then Melanesia said, well, what about us? Yep. Mm. And I'm saying, well, stand in line, let's work together. You know, mm. you know, I'm starting off with Polynesia, but the intention is always to incorporate everybody. Mm. I, I was overseas more recently. Um, we were trying to organize the Pacific Health Ministers together on a vote, and three of our brothers decided they didn't want to be part of a, of a statement. I won't name who they are. But in the end, we met and we talked and talked and talked. In the end, uh, you know, we gave them every reason why they should be part of the team. But you also have to allow them to make their choice and not be part of the team. Yeah. In the end, they weren't part of the team, but we won the vote anyway. Yes. You know? So I, I don't know whether there's an answer to that, but you're absolutely right that one of our strengths is being united, but mm. it takes so much effort to bring us there. Once we get there, oka oka mahaya. Yes. Mm. It's a beautiful thing when we are united in both mind and spirit, but we're not always that way. Mm. In your opinion, this is a different question. <laughs> um, which, which, which political party, national, labor, or whichever one, do you feel has the most opportunities for Pacific people to engage and get involved with politics? Mm. Um, yeah, and why do you think uh, why do you think this and what systems are put in place to support yeah. um, ensuring Pacifica voices are valued and heard mm. Mm. in Parliament? Yeah, look, I mean, I'll, I'll be straight up. The Labour Party has been you know, part of my family's DNA for a long, long time. Completely unbiased. Mm. <laughs> but it, it yeah. doesn't mean that the Labour Party <clears throat> has always been a, a good or perfect party. Yeah. Mm. No yeah. political party is perfect. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was once asked, you know, would I form and establish a Pacific Party? Mm. And I said, no, that I would not. That for our communities, we either support the Labour Party and for those who have gone to the National Party, that's your choice. Mm. The reason why my family supported the Labour Party is, is goes back to history. Um, you know, the, the Labour Party, the first president, supported the Mo movement yeah. and continued to support the Mo movement for Samoa's independence. Mm. Um, and so, but you also have to know history that it was the Maori who visited some of the elders who were imprisoned in Mount Eden. Mm. You know, Maui Pomari, Apirani Ngata. Mm. You know, they supported our elders on, on that time. Um, and so for me, my father, when we, I remember his lectures, tomorrow everybody goes down to the local school and we vote. And so he made sure nobody goes off to work or sports or or to the markets, yep. we always get to vote. Mm. And just as we're going in there, he goes, and you're all voting Labour. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think what's important is that, yes, some families will gravitate towards party. What is important as a former um, minister, look towards what those parties are doing for our communities. Mm. Yeah. Look towards policy. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the key for making good decisions about the party politics. In an MMP system, uh, that was designed always so that Labour and National could never, ever govern alone. Yeah. Um, but what we saw in 2020 was Jacinda and Mania mm. just shooting in there out. Yeah. I don't think it'll ever happen again, but who knows? Mm. In the meantime, people also need to pay attention to the small parties, mm. um, Green Party, the Māori Party. Um, I think whenever a party uses racism, you know, and starts to try and divide our community, we should all be saying no to that party. Absolutely. But, you know, for me, I've supported the Labour Party all my political life. There have been times where the Labour Party uh, policies have been trying and testing. Mm -hmm. And because we're part of that system, we have opportunities and in their annual meetings 
to really thump the table and say, we disagree with this. Mm. Um, in the Labour Party, we have a, a Pacific Sector Caucus structure, mm. which enables us to provide policy um, thinking into the system. And of course, we've tried to build a, a strong Labour team. Yeah. And in many ways, by doing that, we're also saying to the other parties, hopefully you get strong you know, structures to support mm. uh, the team there. And talking to some of the people in the national, they seem to have the same challenges because these are party political systems. Mm. Yeah. And they're not necessarily set up, you know, to understand the kinds of people that we are and what's important to us. So mm. I think people just need to look at the values, policies of those par parties and get involved. And obviously, if they're not going to let you get involved, why would you be part of it then? Mm. Uh, but I would never <laughs> stand away from it. Yeah. You know, because... I have a bad experience. I was banned from being involved in the Pacific part of the National Party. Oh. Is that, yeah. where, you, is that where you're flipping now? Mm. Yeah. I, I'm poli I will call myself politically homeless for now until mm. I can generate my thoughts around everything. But that was my problem, mm. was not allowing space. Mm. I'm okay with disagreement. I'm okay if this person does not, yeah. you know, support the policy I'm putting yeah. forward. But what I'm not going to have is because they don't agree or gatekeeping. That's yeah. what I don't like. Give mm. us a space to argue. Give us a space to do thought. But when they start blocking people out, that's when it becomes problematic. Mm. And then it mm. becomes an elite part of Islanders controlling what Islanders get into yeah. politics. Yeah. Mm. And, and that's, you know, I think, I think there's also a group of young people who don't want to be involved in these political structures but have political views. Mm. Yeah. And I think this platform is a good platform for airing those views. Mm. Um, so I think m my message there is doesn't, people should get to know the parties, get to know what they stand for, and ask themselves, how is that going to impact on my community? Mm. Don't think about individual, think about the collective. Yeah. yeah. And how those policies impact on the collective. Yeah. Mm. Just circling back to what you had said earlier about your dad being like, no, 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 we all got to vote before the, and you got to vote Labour, you know. Um, it reminds me of the last election, where the last election, 2020, I honestly, Jacinda was going to win, like, hands down, <laughs> like, for oh, real. That was right? a fun ride, though, yep. yeah. Yeah, mm. <coughs> like, to be honest. And I just go, and... So my parents are big on like making sure we vote, and I go and I do my vote. I I go and vote, and I come back, and I was like, so, so who did you vote for? And I go, I voted for the Greens. And she mm. goes, What do you vote for the Greens for? <laughs> what does the Greens do? And I was like, Mom, just said it's gonna win anyway. So what? I'll just I'll just let them have my vote, and I like some of their policies. And she's like, Oh, well, you know what? I don't think you should have the nuts about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So where I had to know that. Like, and that's um, as real as it gets yeah. with Pacific parents. <laughs> Can I share with you a secret? Yeah. yeah. Would have been my first vote in 1978. And we were paying attention to the news. My dad always listened to the news, reading the newspaper. And, and, and when he did that, he said that, you know, we're all voting Labour. Of course, he wasn't looking over my shoulders, you know. Um, I remember looking at um, at the national leader, uh, the bald-headed guy in those days. Ooh, okay. so there's a lot of them. <laughs> lot of them. Uh, uh, in those days? Did Muldoon have him? Muldoon. Oh, yeah, Muldoon. Muldoon. Yep. Muldoon. Mm. And I disliked him so much. Yeah. Mm. He looked like a bully, you know. And, and because of the dawn raids period. Yeah. You know, but then I looked at the National, uh, the Labour Party leader. He was such a softly spoken man that I thought, how how on earth is he going to win the fight against yeah. Ramadun? So I voted for this other Balangi man in another party. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. In Papakura. Yeah. Mm. Social credit. Oh, wow. And then I met that man when I was on Manukau City Council. <laughs> yeah. Real true story. I never did tell my dad that. <laughs> oh no! Just expose yourself on the podcast. He did. He did expose himself. We'll be right back. Good morning.
back everyone to your pacific morning show with hana and isa and our guest for today the honorable alpito sua william seo alpito you've left the legacy in pushing pacific languages initiatives here in aotearoa um why are languages well pacific languages just for this framing um so important and why is it important for you Mm. to push and support Mm. these initiatives um, it wasn't just me. This is an initiative from the community. Mm-hmm. And the Ministry of Pacific Peoples in 2018 did consultation with over 2,500 people. Mm-hmm. And unanimously, um, our community says language was an integral part of their well-being. Mm-hmm. And even more important was New Zealand-born uh, young people. Mm-hmm. Those who do not speak the language, mm-hmm. they themselves endorsed it. Mm. Um, but the evidence also from across the world shows that a, a child who can speak their mother tongue is in far better position um, to learn quickly a host of other things. Mm. Uh, Professor May, who's probably um, one of our experts in Māori uh, languages, but also has done research in Pacific, says that this is a space that we need to do more in. Mm. And particularly when Realm Island language countries like Cook Islands, Niue, Tokelau, as well as Tuvalu, those languages are endangered. Yep. Mm. And at the international uh, scene, we are now living in a decade of where the United Nations have rallied together to say that we must be able to build um, and ensure that our indigenous languages uh, thrive and are sustainable. Mm. So the whole world recognizes that indigenous languages, including Pacific languages, are an important part of our well-being. Mm. But languages are also part of who we are. Mm. Yeah. Without the language, we lose a history, yeah. a history of thousands of years of learning. Mm. Um, you know, and some of our own professors, uh, Ayono Fanafi, mm. if you don't have the language, you lose your culture. Mm. Without the culture, the village is in darkness. Yeah. Without language, without you lose your culture. Without culture, you lose your arts. You lose the connections to the forest, the seas, and to the spiritual realm. Mm. You lose your identity. Those who are in the art and understand language and culture will know that you cannot have one without the other. Mm. The the only investment we've made as a government was in 2019 where we put in $20 million mm. into uh, into the Ministry for Pacific Peoples to promote uh, languages to ensure that they thrive over four years. So when you look at over four that's, years... That's 20 million over four years, that's five million a year. Yeah, mm. yeah. Oh, man. Could I you know. put that into perspective for us? Mm. Five million sounds like a lot of money, but sounds if like you could put that money, into... But it, it isn't. Mm. I mean, we also, um, in Budget 2021, secured 20 million into the Ministry of Education, again over four years, mm. to fund... Uh, language units, mm. about 70 language units across the country. Those language units have never been funded for a long, long time wow. to provide support to teachers. Teachers who are teaching those languages are not being paid mm. for their time to teach okay. those. Mm. So, you know, when it comes to money, it's peanuts, uh, the money that we're put into here. But the work has got to be about making sure the languages thrive. As I said, Cook Islands, Niue, Tokelau and Tuvalu are endangered languages, and yet we're not doing a lot about it. The specific uh, language strategy was only launched last year, Mm. um, and that's me pushing it hard to the ministry to get it done. Ministry of Education 
has not yet released their Pacific language education policy. So that's work that has to be done. Work where this small amount of money pays for people to get it done, for policy advice, etc. Mm. So it's peanuts, mm. the money. Um, the language and culture is about the community living and thriving and being able to celebrate who we are in our music, our oratory, dance, and everything else we do uniquely that's ours. Mm. Hey, if you lose the language, you lose your art. Because mm. <laughs> it's the language that contains the the knowledge and experience of what that art and looks like, feels like, should be performed, should be on display. Yeah. Uh, anything else is not Pacific then. Mm. Without the language, it becomes a balangia. Where is Māori in the world? Aotearoa New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. It's the point of difference for Aotearoa New Zealand yeah. when it comes to the international arena. Yeah. I know the iwi leaders, um, when they went to Dubai a couple of years ago for trade, mm. who do they take? Uh, not just business people, but they mm. took a whole bunch of kapahaka yeah. performers. So yeah. they use culture and language and songs and dance as the carpet mm. for doing business. Yeah. Wow. And now they're going to Japan to do the same. That's great. And they've asked for Pacific to be involved in that. Because I don't think I don't think people understand the the power that the Pacific language weeks have and specifically the power that Aotearoa has mm. within Pacific circles. Mm. Cause when we you know, when I say that and when people say that Auckland Tamaki Makoto, the Polynesian or Pacific capital of the world, it really is. Yeah. yeah. You know, we got we have Polyfest that happens here, we have Pasifika that happens here. Mm. Um, the world, you know, looks at us. Exactly. And looks at Hawaii as well, but mainly us. Mm. As, you know, where's, where, where's Pacific culture going mm. yeah. now? Because we're the closest to home mm. for all of us. Samoa, Tonga, Niue, Vanuatu, all of that. Um, and I don't know if you've seen this online, um, but the power that these Pacific Language Weeks have spreads worldwide. Absolutely. Mm. I've seen during Tongan Language Week, these Tongan, um, you know, airport workers that direct air traffic controllers, right? Yes. And they're all, they're all running around in Tongan flags and they're like, happy Tongan Language Week. And they're in like Utah. Mm. And it's like, yeah. And, and that just, that. Uh, yeah, and that just goes to show the power that we have here and the responsibility mm. yes. that we have yeah. here um, to, you know, bear this burden, mm. but uh, <coughs> carry the torch mm. for yep. our people. And I talk to my friends and, you know, colleagues and from Australia and America, and they're like, oh, we always look to New Zealand for, like, right. what's latest in the Pacific is this history right? Mm. Is what this person's saying about a tradition right? They always look to us, New Zealand. So you're right. It does feel like a responsibility in a sense. I mean, mm. you use the word powerful um, or power in that, you know, we can measure how many people are unemployed. We can measure the income levels that people earn. But it's very difficult to measure the confidence mm. level and the mafana. I'm not hearing that <laughs> word again. <laughs> oh, no. I know. Um, <laughs> le anganga sa ili malo. You know, we saw the Tosa Moa mm. where you could not tell people not to put the flag yeah. up. Yeah. Um, you can't measure that. And with language weeks, what, is, what I've seen going into some of those primary schools. Those young people standing up with confidence, yeah, giving uh, this wonderful oratory in Samoa, or doing a pe in Cook Island, mm. or singing a Tongan mm. song or hymn that was written by Queen Salote, you know, mm. all in that, and and just to see the the confidence, the pride, and seeing how emotional the parents are mm. to hear. A New Zealand born son or grandson or daughter or granddaughter yeah. doing that here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. That's the power of our language weeks and why all other nations with 
large uh, populations are looking to us. It's also a human right. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why the Human Rights Commission have always backed Samoa was the first language week mm. because the Fangasa, the Teachers Association, they knew the value of languages in our education. And then supported by our radio stations in our languages, supported by the human rights. So it's a human rights issue as well. Mm. And whoever is criticizing and saying, take the money from here for there, you know, they just need to rethink their strategy. Just to um to wrap this up, um, I feel like you are one of our most experienced Pacific politicians here in New Zealand. For anyone watching the show and wanting to pursue a political career, our Pasifika youth, what would be one advice that you would give to them if they are wanting to go down that pathway? Find your own voice first. And when you find your voice, you'll know what to do. Um, but I'd also say... You know, in the Palangi world, um, we've got to learn and be comfortable and confident in the Palangi world, but don't lose your values. Don't lose mm. who you are. Don't lose your point of difference. Yeah. And your point of difference is I am Samoa. Mm. <laughs> For me, I am a Matai Samoa. I love my identity. I love who I am. I love my point of difference. And and I suppose in many ways it's helped me see a broader lens about how to approach problems, how to approach bringing people together, mm-hmm. etc. And I think um, I, I trust our young people that when they find their voice and they look towards the stories from their parents and grandparents, mm-hmm. um, that they they'll be they'll do the right thing. And I think. Um, and I would just say to them, be confident to who you are. Mm. You know, uh, politics is a weird sort of, it's a system mm. about how to govern uh, people. Jacinda changed that in many ways when she started using the word kindness. And what was amazing about that was the opposition criticized her. But in our families, we always say, we love a leader that also is compassion and loves. Yep. So. To that we say good morning. <laughs> mm-hmm.